we crossed a way that was owned by a fellow from Fort Lauderdale with Paper Tiger in the Gulf Stream. First time we sailed her in my Nassau race. Crossed her bow in a really nasty night, evening. It was just before dark. And uh, Professor Hood, Ted Hood's father, and I, after that race was over, we got together exchanging notes uh, while uh, we were waiting for his son to show up. Oops. <laughs> was, uh, uh, but we were talking about the dynamics. And Paper Tiger, that you saw here, and you saw that 60 footer Meridia. Paper Tiger was the mathematical weight distribution. The mass centroids were, were used in a program over at Cape Canaveral. Uh, Dr. Dennis, who Meridia was built for, he had owned the Paper Tiger while he was waiting for us to get this boat, big 60 footer, out for him. And we did these studies and with his inertial scientists that could designers of these rockets, and they got fascinated with them. all of the dynamics and the degrees of freedom that a yacht has in, in a typical Gulf Stream sea. But they, the shoal draft keel center borders make far better weather than I can tell you that. Yes, sir. Charlie, did, was there not some adjustment to the, to the uh, lead weight inherited at some point before the race didn't have to add or take off? Yes. Uh, we did do that. We, what we did is I think I mentioned in the talk that, that we got the news that the dynamometer had been uh, showing up uh, with a, when they recalibrated it. So what, what we always do is we test the boats in all these different attitudes, but, but we typically will run in the upright condition. We will run them bow down. Then we will run them at, at, at one degree, two, three degrees, looking for a sweet spot. Then we would peel them to one side in order to see if, if healing with the bow down helped some. Well, they they sent a letter out saying, you know, we need to we need to uh, to trim them down by the bow. Of course, they were scared definitely going to lose the cup. Uh, and we we got busy. Took 600 pounds of lead out of her, and uh, were remeasured. Of course, we had to move all, move all the marks on the hull. And she was faster. Um, we sailed the last race, nose to nose, toe to toe, with the traffic. We had a lured berth start on her down at the lured end of the line. And we went all the way out to the lay line. And I was afraid to tack her. I could have could tacked, but I didn't dare do it until we saw the, that we were overlaying the marks, so and we both had to tack. <laughs> And we got her up to, so I would do in a moderate breeze, and we were as fast, boat for boat, as, as intrepid that year. Well, it was too late to do much for that. And uh, so anyhow, that's, yeah, we did modify. We would like to have modified it a great deal more once we knew what was going on. Yes, sir. I have a question for you. Uh, we all know what's happened in the America's Cup, and as a starboat sailor, I was at the same regatta two weeks ago that you were at. Oh, really? Tampa. Yep. What did you think of John Dane's rig, and is that what's going to filter filter, filter down into our around the buoy racing? Well, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. I didn't see John. John, John Dane had like a custom 60 foot uh, house houseboat that he lodged his crew and bed on. Oh, yeah. And it had a deck out back with a crane. And he pulled two star boats and put it on the I've never seen anything like that in my life. Well, here's what's going on. You it's know, going crazy. It, it cost me a million and a half dollars nominally to build an American campaign in America's Cup contender in 1970. And and I I was just the happiest kid on the street, you know, that, that I could wind up in life being able to do that. I was 40 years old. Today, I don't think you can buy a carbon fiber mast for one for that much money. You probably couldn't buy a mainsail. You probably couldn't, you know, the Titanic, the, the high strength rigging for those boats is would just be enormously expensive. The I'm not against the evolution technically 
Um, but it's, you know, the, they hire the crews like they hire IndyCar racers or, you know, they, you, you, you're on a contract, you can't sail with anybody else, and, uh, and you may be replaced tomorrow, so you've got no future. <laughs> and I don't know, there's just, it's lost its charm in many, many ways, but then I sound like a menopausal little man when I get going on. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I yes, yes, sir. Chairman, your 22 is an assessment at all. There's a couple of here that's walking, and I was asked to ask you, you know, we might find some original specifications. A lot of those boats have gone through modifications. A couple of guys want to make sure they Well, right. you know, uh, there, I, I am finally getting access to some of the archives. You know, Morgan Yacht Convention was acquired. I would say I retired in, in 72. Later, the company was acquired by, by <laughs> Kathleen, and I'm great friends with, with, uh, with all the guys out there, and, and they run a great show. But all of that material has just been virtually inaccessible. Only lately have I had an opportunity to go out and, and dredge through it and begin to find, and I'm putting it up on the website as I'm able. It's, it takes a lot, of, it's a lot of work, and I don't, my darling wife here, Hair hurts when I start talking about getting more of it up on the web. But we're trying to get it up there for, for posterity and get it out, you know, captured in an interstellar space. But I, I, think, I think there is a manual that, that I can get my hands on, and I haven't seen the lines drawings. Um, they're probably there, but lots of it got lost. There's several owners after it. I retired and the company was sold in a couple of different investment groups. Anybody else? Yes, sir. America's Cup. What are we going? What's going to happen? Uh, hard to say. I, 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 I'd say that any of about four or five have a real chance of doing it. Will we win it again? We. Uh, well, I think the only chance we have this go round is uh, is uh, or. That's the only American contingent or under our flag. But who? Or Larry Ellis. Larry Ellis and Larry Ellis. Or that's, that's a software company. Again, you know, it's a billionaire uh, doing it. Yeah, I think we could do it, but it won't be easy. It's something to, you have to test. I know so some of your early designs, a lot of them were y'all rigs. Do you like what y'all rig in a lot? Well, I, yeah, so, you know, uh, Carl Mitchell. Finisterre was a yaw. And let me just tell you some of the thoughts that I know Carlton had about it. And, and I certainly, Paper Tiger actually was pretty much a catch district, a small catch rig. But um, when you're cruising and you're shorthanded and you are getting near a landfall or you get there sooner than you thought you arrived at night uh, and you want to go slower, you just drop the main and go under jib and jigger. And you're up on your feet and you can cook. And uh, if, you're, you, if you are in dirty weather and you, um, in Paper Tiger, which I, I'm sorry to be so referred to so often, we would take the main down. If we were taking the boat back from Nassau, you know, and you get in the Gulf Stream and shouting, well, we'd take the main down, put up the deck on it, set the mizzen staysail, and we'd go close haul with a small mizzen staysail and, and she's up on her feet and we're cooking and we're under the shade, you know. Uh, so catch rigs are good. You know, cutter rigs are okay for a larger boat if you don't want to have a catch or a, or a yawl. But they were called, as I was growing up getting into the designing game, they were called uh, uh, cheater yawls. What's a cheater yawl? Well, it was right there in the room, you know, so Bolero, the great, beautiful, gorgeous Bolero of Owen Stevens, 72-footer, had a little yaw rig, and there were many others that they got out. And that was because the sale area counted only 50 cents on the dollar, the rating. The four triangle was 100 percent, the main was some less percentage based on the aspect ratio, whatever. But that, yes, but I like the yaw rig, it was, I mean, 
clean yaw rig, uh, well engineered, and, and uh, the right distance between the trailing edge and the main. Good um, looking evening tool. The evening tool. Oh man, it, and when you've got breaking seas and <coughs> overpowering seas, you know, and you're still trying to make to, some weather out of it, you reef the main. You still got that, and you strap it down and it holds your head up. A lot of boats, modern boats, with cutaway forefoots, you know, more pay off. And so you can, good, good seamanship to have. I, I'm all for them. Yes, sir. And on this uh, boat handling, a lot of the uh, cruising boats, in particular, the trend is toward using uh, mechanical advantage through electronic, electric winches and that sort of gear. And so people are generally buying 45 foot, foot boats for couples and that sort of thing. How do you feel about that sort of trend? Uh, for cruising? Yeah. Using sort of the big boat trend towards, you know, you got 60 well, you know, cruisers out there because they're using electric uh, winches. Well, I don't think you want to depend on this. I'm pretty sure they, they actually put a crank in them and use yeah, them. Yeah, sure. But uh, you got the battery size, capacity right? and you got the generator and all the other yeah, that's, that's systems to go along with it. You got the checkbook to write for that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's it's it, it takes away with you. Get in our age group, my age group, but uh, you know you kind of go pumping on those those <laughs> things. I, I I'm used to luffing up, taking up the slack. There you go. Save yourself. Five thousand bucks for that winch, but you know when back in the days when you bought this stuff you saw here, the biggest winch, but the Paper Tiger, the biggest winch you could buy off the shelf, I think was a number five Merriman, which had a, a plug on handle on the top that sit on that damn thing and break your coxes. And you know they just didn't have that on the shelf. You got you got your boat the forty one uh, was fairly manageable with the catch of the Otter Island, yep. and now the typical cruising boat today is like a high was fifty four. Got an immense amount of sail area. You've got a big boat handle. We got bow thrusters and things like oh, that. Oh sure. The, the trend toward toward these big boats is. It's all marketing, and if you a marketing yeah. field. It's if you if you got the checkbook for it. Yeah. I had, you know, if you want to do it. I, I don't know that I, I. I think there's a lot of seamanship going down the drain. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, I won't get into that too much, except good seamanship. Uh, but you better be learning before you take off on any of these things. I don't care what you've got in the way of equipment. And, you know, I, I learned to navigate in, uh, at night uh, during the tail end of World War II, or maybe it was, it must have been, the yeah, Korean War. Uh, and we were at the University of Tampa because uh, I was expected to go to war and had, I thought I was going to wind up in the air sea rescues. And people don't know how to navigate. Day. We go out to Bermuda on that boat rage that you saw in the film there, all the hair soft. We could not get a sight, a good sight. We couldn't see the sun, stars, or moon. We could see the images of them. And he got it, put us right on the pin because he's a great navigator. Wrote one of the best books on it, by the way. If you're ever looking for a book on navigation, he's going to understand. I don't have it, but it's uh, put out by um, Time Life series, you know, all of those series on everything under the sun and Halsey Harrisoff did do that and it is one of the best books I'm told on, on celestial navigation but I think uh, I think there ought to be an awful lot more going on uh, Nobody from the standpoint of seamanship <laughs> I'm doing an article that will be out sometime uh, on thoughts on hard weather sailing uh, and that has to do with some of the foolish things we do and some of the things that you better be doing. They're not, my comments won't be the end all comments related to, to heavy weather sailing. There's a lot of good literature out there. And, uh, but I want to point up to a lot of people that I see 